The demons found in that time I got reincarnated as a slime are definitely some of the more interesting species found in the series and like most of the inhabitants in this world, they have a lot of depth to them as well. And none are more interesting than the primordial demons, the oldest and most powerful demons found in the series. That's why in this supercut version, let's take a look at the 7 primordial demons of the Tensura world to learn more about them. Also, who do you think is the strongest among the 7 primordial demons and who is your favourite ones? So let's get into it. And before that, don't forget to leave a like, share the video with your friends and maybe consider subscribing to the channel, it really helps. <laughs> So who is Rain? She is basically one of the 7 primordial demons, considered to be the oldest and most powerful demons in the Tensura world and she was known as the Blue Primordial Blue before she acquired her name. And during her time in the underworld, she became best friends with Vert, the Green Primordial and wanting to overthrow the Red Primordial Rouge, she enlisted the help of Vert and they decided to challenge him. But in the end, both of them were utterly crushed by him, even having their cause destroyed. However, for the primordial demons, they can never be killed even if their cores are destroyed and they can simply revive after a period of time with all their personalities intact. But following the unspoken rule of the demon race, because their cores were destroyed by Gi, they decided to serve him for all of eternity as his loyal servants when they were revived. Now, when Gi was summoned to the material world by the super magic empire and had become the first true demon lord, he summoned rain and misery to the world as well, giving them the orders to wipe out the nation that has summoned him from the face of the earth. They fulfilled the order and the super magic empire was no more. He would then allow the both of them to stay in the material world, but because they lost most of their powers when they were summoned from the underworld, he decided to give them physical bodies to inhabit. However, even though they acquired bodies, their powers were still weakened and no matter how many human souls they collected, rain and misery remained the same. But remembering that he managed to evolve after acquiring a name, he decided to name them. Thus, Rain would acquire her name, causing her to evolve into a demon peer and apparently Gi gave her this name because it was raining that day. And from that day onwards, Rain along with Misery would become the left and right hands of the absolute ruler Gi Crimson. During her time in the material world, Rain travelled with Gi to various places and she even learned many skills like cooking, washing, singing, dancing or playing musical instruments. And according to her, out of all the skills that she managed to acquire, she preferred painting the most and she was quite talented as well. But despite the talents as a maid, she's quite lazy and useless, often complaining about work and leaving most of the annoying jobs to Misery instead. Nevertheless, Rain continued to serve her master to the fullest and when Gi was chosen by the Star King Dragon Valdenawa to serve as the mediator of the world, she would summon many of her own dependents to secretly build up a network of information to more effectively assist her master in this new role. And on a side note, Mizora was one of the demons that Rain summoned and she's basically the second in command of Rain, helping to lead her demon subordinates. Mizora is also a demon in the Archduke class which is similar to Moss, the lieutenant of the White Primordial but in terms of power, she's still weaker than Moss although she does make up for it with her fighting experience. But sadly, unlike Moss who has a very capable master like Tessrosa, Mizora has to always deal with idiotic and reckless behaviour of her master Rain, even sometimes needing to do her job. Also since I mentioned Tessrosa, Rain had apparently encountered the White Primordial Blanc in one of the Eastern Nations during some point in time and engaged her in battle. It wasn't explicitly stated how the battle ended but it likely ended in a draw between the two because she had around the same strength and powers as the Demonus trio. In any case, Gi eventually established the Demonus system and it was also around this time that he decided to find a base to settle down so he decided to occupy the now destroyed Imperial Castle of the Super Magic Empire and Rain was responsible for rebuilding the castle and creating a comfortable environment for a master. But back to the Demolot system, Rain helped to spread the idea of the system through the subjugation of various powers like local gods, demons and margins. And whenever a new Demolot appeared, Rain would be the one to recruit them into the council which led to the creation of the Walpurgis Banquet. Also, Rain and Misery would serve as guides for other Demolots like what we saw in the anime. Speaking of the anime, Rain made her anime debut in season 2 and in episode 22, she acted as the host for the Walpurgis Banquet called by Demolot Claimant but her screen time was quite short. However, in the light novel and the later parts of the story, she does get more time as a character so I'll be going over some of the events involving her. Obviously, like I said, she has the host for the Walpurgis Banquet we saw in the anime and after Rimuru dealt with Clayman, the remaining demon lords were treated to a meal prepared by her and Misery. The next time we see Rain again will be during the incident with Grandpa Rosso in the Holy Kingdom of Lubarius. When Grandpa attacked Rimuru with his forces, he had realised that the balance of power within the western nations was in danger. So he ordered Rain and Misery to invade as well so the humans would unite and stop fighting. Rain would arrive at the outskirts of Lubarius and she intentionally made her presence known so that the Black Primordial Diablo could detect her. Diablo soon arrived and she engaged him in battle. 
She attacked first with a nuclear cannon, a physical attack which uses her fist to launch magical missiles infused with nuclear magic. But Diablo simply dispelled all her attacks and the battle was decided when Rain was caught inside his multi-stage disintegration spell. Rain was defeated but it was only a clone created from her miss ability which allows her to create clones that can access all her abilities but the consciousness is only retained in the original body. The real Rain appeared with Yi and after exchanging a few words with Diablo, they both left and the incident with Grand Barroso was resolved. Later, during the Tempest Federation's war with the Eastern Empire, Diablo had asked Yi to visit and when he arrived, he was accompanied by Rain, Misery and the true dragon Valzad. Rimuru threw a small party for them and they were impressed by the desserts that Shuna made, so Gi asked Rimuru to allow Rain and Misery to train under her which she accepted. Of course, besides baking lessons, Gi asked Rimuru to awaken Rain and Misery into true demons because no matter how many times he tried, it always failed. The reason is because their nature was altered after receiving their names, so in order for them to awaken, you needed to adjust the souls to match their new wavelengths, only then it would work. So Gi asked how many souls were required, and Wisdom King Raphael tricked Rimuru into asking for 500,000 to scam Gi, and they actually only needed 200,000 for Rain and Misery to awaken. But regardless, Rimuru started the Harvest Festival ritual and transferred the souls into Rain and Misery, and because she had met the requirements to awaken, she doesn't need to be connected to Rimuru through a soul corridor. The Harvest Festival was successful, causing Rain to awaken into a true demon lord and evolving from a demon peer into a devil lord, the highest evolutionary stage of the demon race. Afterwards, Gi and his group returned to the Frozen Palace and later they would be attacked by Phantom King Fatway. He was apparently after the dragon call of Valzad, so he took control over her mind and she was forced to fight Gi while he fought against Rain and Misery. In the end, Rain and Misery were defeated by Fatway and were badly injured, but Gi managed to force Fatway and Valzad to retreat. He would quickly call for the next Valpurgus and Rain was sent to escort Rimuru and Remorus in Tempest. However, she apparently forgot about Remorus and left her behind because she was still distracted by her injuries, luckily Misery went back to get Remorus. So when the Demolons finally gathered, Valpurgus began and during the discussion to distribute their forces to reinforce the Demolons, he decided that he along with Rain and Misery would relocate to El Dorado, the domain of Leon Cromwell to provide assistance. Rimuru also sent Diablo to El Dorado which was a bad idea because apparently for the past two weeks, Rain and Diablo were constantly fighting although she was getting beaten to a pulp every time. She even brought Misery to fight 2 on 1 against Diablo and yet she still lost to him. However, Rain and Diablo eventually became friendlier with each other when he started to share the gospel of Rimuruism with her. And she became quite interested in hearing the stories about Rimuru. So in exchange for more stories, she was commissioned by Diablo to create paintings of Rimuru and then spreading them across the world through her information network but later their secret dealings would be exposed. Also around this time, Rain had gotten strong enough to fight even Leon Cromwell. Now having said that, Beltway eventually led his forces to attack El Dorado and Rain's interaction here was probably the funniest in the series. Because during the battle, she and Misery had encountered the two fallen angels Pika and Gracia but she didn't want to fight due to the cold weather created by Valzad. She started complaining and soon both the fallen angels followed as well but what she did next was hilarious. She basically used Freezing Hell Cocutus, a powerful spell that is considered to be very dangerous magic to create a block of ice and then Gracia used her icebreaker to help create an igloo. They would go inside the igloo to chill and Rain proceeded to chat with the two fallen angels like it was nothing. She even told them how Rimuru awakened her and Misery. But it wasn't all bad because Rain did get some useful information from them as well like how they are being controlled by the mana smiker and the full extent of the enemy forces. Maybe Rain is secretly a tactical genius. Although afterwards they just continued to talk about random bullshit and what's worse, Rain started to roast some sweet potatoes and drink sake with them. This is a good example of why Gi thinks that his subordinates are useless idiots and you know what, Rain is definitely the aqua of the Tensura world with the way she behaves. So it wasn't surprising that after the battle in El Dorado, Rain was reprimanded by Gi and even when confronted, she just denied everything. Mizora even tried to plead with Gi to release her master but he was having none of it and rejected her. She didn't continue because she knew her master was a lost cause. Rain really is a dumbass but hey at least she managed to get some useful information about the enemies. But jokes aside, it was kind of disappointing we don't really get a chance to learn more about her skills and abilities so maybe in future volumes we'll get some more information about it. Also, I highly recommend reading the side story in volume 17 because it actually tells the events evolving Rain through her own perspective so it's a good way to give you a better understanding of her personality and thought process as a character. To start, Mizari or also known as the Green Primordial Verb before she has given her name is part of the 7 Primordial Demons, the oldest and strongest demons in the demon realm. She is the progenitor of all the demons under her colour and like the other primordial demons, she is assisted by her demon lieutenant Khan, a Marquis caste demon who helps to lead her demon subordinates. 
During her time in the Demon Realm, she eventually befriended Rain the Blue Primordial and even joined her in an attempt to overthrow Guy Crimson the Red Primordial. She and Rain would fight Guy but they failed to defeat him and they were utterly crushed by him. Her demon core was also destroyed in the process causing her to perish but because primordial demons are basically immortal, she is simply resurrected and following the unspoken rule of the demon race, she would pledge her loyalty to Guy and serve him for all of eternity. One day, her master Guy was summoned to the material world by the super magic empire tasked with destroying the enemies of said empire. After Guy destroyed the enemies of the Empire, he managed to evolve into the first true demon lord and he proceeded to summon both Misery and Rain to the material world as well. They were both given the orders to destroy the super magic empire and later, Guy realized that crossing from the underworld to this world caused Misery and Rain to lose most of their power. So in order to rectify this, they were given bodies to inhabit solidifying their place in the material world and he also gave them names which helped them to regain their powers allowing them to break through the ceiling of power for demons evolving from arch demons into demon peers. That's basically how Misery would acquire her name and her name actually represents the mournful cries of the grieving humans. After this, Misery would accompany her master Guy to travel and experience the new world they are in, even picking up some additional skills like cooking, singing, music, fine arts and many more so that she is able to more perfectly serve her master. Essentially, Misery and Rain serve as Guy's maids but between the two of them, Misery is definitely the more useful and hardworking one, always being given the more tedious task by Rain because she is too lazy to do it herself. Also, Misery is quite a meek and shy individual so it's no wonder she would often get dragged into dumb situations by Rain. And because of this, she has treated as an idiot by Guy most of the time simply through the indirect association with Rain. In any case, Misery still takes her task very seriously and is fully devoted to her master. When Guy was asked by the Star King Dragon Valdenava to be the mediator of the Tantra world, she summoned many of her own dependents to infiltrate and gather information on human society so they can help monitor those who needed to be purged by her master. Misery also established a cult called the Apostles of Vert which has her acting as the green deity they worship. The doctrine of the Apostles of Vert is to basically summon the green deity to plunge the world into anarchy but in reality, it was something that Misery prepared on a whim to keep human society under surveillance and allow her to obtain information for master. Later, Guy would establish the Demilot as a system to instill fear onto human society so they wouldn't destroy themselves and Misery was tasked with handling its administrative affairs. Additionally, she sometimes serves as a guide for the other Demilots as well because she had the ability to open dimensional gates to travel. Also, they eventually made the old ruins of the super magic empire into their home and it would become a frozen wasteland when Valza fought against Guy, so Misery and Rain were responsible for maintaining the castle in good condition. But anyways, we finally saw Misery in season 2 of the anime as she was the guy that escorted Rimuru and Ramorous to the Walpurgis banquet called by Demlock Claimant. However, that was the extent of her appearance in the anime and it's only in the light novel that we get to see a bit more of her. So in this next portion, I wanted to go over her story timeline after Walpurgis and soon after Claimant was defeated by Rimuru, she along with Rain prepared a meal for the rest of the Demon Lords to enjoy before sending them home. Misery would appear again when Grandpa Rosso waged war against Luminous Valentine. This had disturbed the balance in the western nation so Guy had ordered Misery to unite humanity with fear. So Misery came up with a plan to infiltrate the western nation council and kill the elected councillors to remind them the threat of the Demon Lords. And because the Apostles of Verb was also employed by the accomplices of Grandpa to capture the council, one of the members had summoned their green deity so Misery took the opportunity to appear. But before she could complete her mission, she was surprised to find Tesrosa, the white primordial there among the councillors. Because Guy had only ordered her to cause a disturbance in the capital of Ingratia, she decided it wasn't worth the risk to fight one of the primordial demons and she knew that Tesrosa had more combat experience than her despite Misery having more magic kills. Furthermore, Moss was also present so Misery definitely didn't want to fight two demon peers at the same time. So she decided to retreat and leave the Apostles of Word to die because to her, the card was merely a disposable tool and she could always create another one. That said, she would later regroup with her master in the Holy Kingdom of Luberus to report the situation and they would encounter Yuki along with the moderate count troop trying to escape after they had released the hero Konoha. Misery and Rain easily took down and captured Footman and Tear. However, they were ordered to release the two clowns after Guy decided to make a deal with Yuki and the incident with Grandpa also ended. Another time Misery had an appearance was during the Tempest Federation's war with the Eastern Empire. To be precise, it was after Tempest won the first battle and Diablo had called Guy to visit Tempest. Obviously, Misery followed her master to Tempest and they were treated to a small party thrown by Rimuru. 
They were surprised and impressed by the confectionaries made by Shuna, so Yi asked Rimuru to let Misery and Rain stay in temples to learn from Shuna, and Rimuru agreed to the request, but that wasn't all. Because apparently, Yi had once tried to give Misery some souls to awaken, but it didn't trigger any awakening, so he just gave up. But after learning that Rimuru has managed to awaken Diablo, he decided to let Rimuru awaken Misery and Rain into true Dim Lords. Rimuru was reluctant to help but he was afraid of Yi so he was forced to promise to awaken both the demoners. Yi then gave Rimuru the souls needed and Wisdom King Raphael had actually tricked Rimuru into asking for 500,000 souls but Yi doesn't know about it so it was fine. Rimuru proceeded with the Harvest Festival for Misery and because she had already met all the requirements to evolve, she doesn't need to have a soul corridor established with him to receive the souls for awakening. A hundred thousand souls were transferred to Misery causing her to awaken into a true demon lord and evolving from a demon peer into a devil lord, the highest evolutionary stage of the demon race. After Rimuru helped Gi awaken his girls, they returned to their home but they were later attacked by Phantom King Feltway who was after Valza's dragon call. Feltway had broken through the barriers surrounding the frozen palace, so Misery and Rain went out to engage him in battle while Gi was dealing with a mind control Valza. Feltway easily defeated Misery and Rain and he retreated with Valza afterwards. He would then call for the next Valpurgus to prepare for the upcoming battle with Feltway, and both the girls were again sent out to escort the other demon lords. Misery was sent to bring Milim and Dagru in their respective nations, while Rain was sent to bring Rimuru and Ramorus in Tempest. However, Rain had apparently forgotten about Ramorus, so Misery later went to get her as well. When all the demon lords finally gathered, Valpurgus began and Gi ordered Rimuru to send his forces to help the other demon lords, while Gi along with his forces will be relocating to El Dorado, the domain of Leon Cromwell as reinforcements. Also, to make the logistic easier, Rimuru was tasked with setting up magic transfer circles in each of the demon lords' territory, so Misery used her dimensional gaze to bring him to their respective nations. Having said that, they all prepared for the upcoming battle and during her time in El Dorado, she was constantly dragged into fighting Diablo by rain, but every time they were defeated by him. Misery continued to serve her master and after some time had passed, Beltway and his forces finally attacked El Dorado. Both sides engaged each other in battle and Misery along with Rain would encounter the fallen angels Pico and Gracia. Misery was ready to fight but to a surprise, Rain, Pico and Gracia weren't too interested in fighting especially in the cold weather that Valzat had brought with her. She was further dumbfounded when Rain casually used Freezing Hell Cocutus, a spell that can basically destroy an entire nation to create an igloo with the help of Gracia. The three girls proceeded to go inside the igloo to escape from the cold and Misery gave up trying to understand and simply joined them. As the battle outside rages on, the girls simply continue to relax, eat, drink and talk to one another and Rain even acquired some useful information from the two fallen angels. Now when the battle ended, Gi and Rimuru's forces gathered to exchange whatever information they managed to acquire during the battle. But sadly for Misery and Rain, they were both being punished by Gi because he found the two dumbasses were having fun drinking while everyone else were fighting desperately. Luckily for Misery, she was visibly reflecting on her actions and she was forgiven by Master thanks to a subordinate Khan who begged Gi to release his Master. But yeah, that's basically everything we got on Misery so far and like I said in the beginning, she doesn't get a lot of time as a character and she never really has any chance of showing her powers as well. So if I had to take a guess, her skills are probably something related to spatial or dimensional attributes. But if you have any guesses about her skills or abilities, feel free to share your own opinions in the comments below. Also, as of making this video, I still haven't read volume 20 so I'm not sure if her character gets more development, but I do hope to at least get some more information about her. To start, Carrera or the Yellow Primordial Jun was one of the Primordial Demons that ruled over the Underworld. He's a battle maniac who constantly fought with the White and Purple Primordial in the Underworld and because of their constant fighting, they would earn the nickname of the Demoners Trio. Before she was recruited by Diablo, the Yellow Primordial was responsible for guarding the Underworld Gate located in El Dorado, the country ruled by Demon Lord Leon Cromwell. Because the gate was located quite close to the capital of El Dorado, she would come out on a daily basis to fire random nuclear magic on the city for fun and she's basically a blonde Megumin. Leon even tried to negotiate with her on multiple occasions but she just ignored him. Honestly, I feel really bad for Leon and I can see why the Yellow Primordial has the worst reputation out of all the other Primordial Demons because she is just too unpredictable and destructive. Having said that, Diablo later went into the Underworld to recruit subordinates to help with his work where he invited the Demon Trio to meet with his master, Rimuru Tempest. The only reason they agreed to Diablo's offer was because they were curious what kind of person Rimuru was and how he managed to impress someone like Diablo. 
When they met Rimuru, he thought they didn't look that strong and he dismissed them as stressed, but Wisdom King Raphael corrected him which made it look like he wasn't afraid of them. However, the Yellow Primordial was still suspicious of him, so when she introduced herself, she released some of her aura to intimidate him, but he didn't react to it which made her think that he was ignoring her and it actually impressed her. Seriously, Rimuru is one of the most oblivious and luckiest person in the series. But anyways, the Yellow Primordial pledged her allegiance to him, offering two high-ranking demon lieutenants and 200 demon soldiers to serve him. Then the Demoness Trio followed him to the Labyrinth where he provided majesty bodies for their demon subordinates to inhabit. For the Demoness Trio themselves, they were provided a special type of Orichalcum body that was made by mixing gold into majesty. The Orichalcum bodies are stronger and it allows for better magical manipulation than the average majesty ones. After the Yellow Primordial possessed the Orichalcum body and awakened, Rimuru decided to give her the name of Carrera, named after the Porsche 911 Carrera. After the naming, Carrera evolved from an Ash Demon into a Demon Peer and she now has a Disaster Class threat level. Additionally, her two Demon subordinates were given names as well. One was named after the Cornicite Agara and the other was named after the Lotus Esprit. Carrera and her Demon subordinates would then become part of the Black Numbers, an elite unit that directly serves Rimuru Tempest and is under the command of Diablo. But besides that, Carrera was also assigned to be the Chief Justice Officer of the Supreme Court in Tempest where she worked alongside the Attorney General Ruger, one of the Goblin Elders. Her job basically requires her to lead the Supreme Court during public sessions when the court is hearing arguments and during private conferences when the court is discussing and deciding cases. It was the perfect job for Carrera because she had no interest in wealth or status and only understood the concept of strength so she would never fall victim to bribery. Although she would often get into fights with the chief prosecutor, the Purple Primordial Ultima, over things like how to extradite criminals and the treatment of suspects in court. That said, when the Eastern Empire attacked Tempest, she was ordered to oversee the second legion that was led by Gael and assist in the defense of the Labyrinth. During the siege, Carrera wanted to join the battle because Tessarosa and Ultima were bragging to her through thought communication about their victories, but Benimaru ordered her to wait for the right moment, which she took quite well. Eventually, Carrera and Gael were finally allowed to join the battle, and on the battlefield, she was ordered to just scare the remaining Imperial army, so she decided to use her most powerful nuclear magic gravity collapse against the remaining 200,000 Imperial soldiers. This spell is considered an evil form of magic and it's basically a miniature black hole that crushes anyone caught within its sphere of influence. The soldiers did try their best to block the spell by setting up anti-magic barriers and using legion magic to buff their magical resistance but in the end, 80% of the 200,000 soldiers were turned into dust. This really shows how terrifying Carrera's magical output truly is. Having said that, after the Eastern Empire forces were defeated, Rimuru held a reward ceremony to awaken the 12 patrons into true demon lords and Carrera was one of them. However, she was not given any souls to awaken but only the title of Menace Lord as a reward. The reason was because Rimuru did not have enough souls to awaken the demoness trio together and he wanted to maintain the balance of power between them. But later he did acquire enough souls to awaken them into true demon lords when Wisdom King Raphael had scammed Gee Crimson out of half a million souls. During the Second Eastern Empire attack, the Demoness Trio was given orders to fight and delay the true Dragon Valgren and even though it was just a parallel existence that only has 20% of her power, they were still unable to defeat her. Herrera even tried to use a gravity collapse on Valgren but it didn't work so she decided to use the sword fighting techniques that Agara taught her. Although they did put up a decent fight against Valgren, they were eventually overwhelmed by her and lost the battle. After the battle, Herrera finally evolved into a true Demon Lord and later she would regroup with Benimaru and the others so they could raid the flagship of Emperor Rudra. On the airship, the raiding party had faced off against the remaining forces of Emperor Rudra and it was decided that Carrera would be fighting the leader of the Imperial Near Guards, Lieutenant Kondo. He was considered to be one of the strongest individuals in the Eastern Empire, rivaled only by Damrada and Valgren. He was also at the level of a saint, the highest evolutionary stage of humans, and he had the threat level of a disaster class. He was even strong enough to manifest an ultimate skill called the King of Execution by himself without borrowing power from Emperor Rudra. During their battle, Carrera was joined by Agara because he wanted a rematch against Kondo but he was too strong for Agara so she had to step in. Because the sword was damaged by Kondo, Agara proceeded to transform himself into a sword and the battle would begin. But because Kondo possessed an ultimate skill while Carrera did not, she was having a hard time defeating him and she soon realized how powerful he really was. Despite that, Carrera was not afraid, instead she was filled with a sense of euphoria and she even started to have a fondness for Kondo because she was able to face such a powerful opponent. I guess that's why people were always stripping Carrera and Kondo. But anyways, the fight continued and Kondo managed to cut off her left hand which enraged her because he had harmed the body created by Rimuru. When she was about to lose control, Gera was able to calm her down and even made her realize that she has been underestimating her opponent so she finally accepted Kondo as her equal and became serious. However, Kondo still had the advantage of an ultimate skill over Carrera and he eventually landed a fatal blow on her. He managed to cut open the left side of her belly and due to the effect of his skill coupled with the fatigue, she was unable to heal the injury instantly causing her to leak out magic. 
On the verge of defeat, a newly awakened seal had reached out to Carrera, offering her power, and the power she received was in the form of the ultimate skill Annihilation King Abaddon, the absolute power that can destroy everything, but I'll talk about the skill later. For now, let's continue with the battle first, and because now that Carrera has her own ultimate skill, she regained her strength and was about to unleash her strongest magic attack, the final collapse Annihilation Wave to end the fight. This is an ultimate level magic that surpassed even gravity collapse, and it was so powerful that it could be used to destroy the planet. By placing matter evolved from the bottom of hell in the gravitational collapse force field, the magic created from the reaction will release a powerful wave of energy blast that is said to be beyond comprehension. Kondo knew that he couldn't stop the attack and desperate to end things as well, he charged towards Carrera, taking the full blast of final collapse, but as he got close, Carrera used the sword art 100 flower dazzle, breaking Kondo's blade and slashing through his shoulder. With that, Kondo fell, but before he died, he asked Carrera to inherit his broken gun and fulfill his promise to Emperor Rudra, which is to kill him with the gun if he ever loses control. He offered everything he has including his soul to Carrera, and the moment his fingers touched the broken gun, it blossomed with a golden glow transforming the material of the gun into the mythical grade. His soul fused with the gun and he has now basically become Carrera's new partner which is quite fitting. Now let's talk about Carrera's new ultimate skill Annihilation King Abaddon and like I said it's an absolute power that can destroy everything. It has a total of 7 sub skills and 5 of them are the usual ones like Thought Acceleration, Universal Perception, Demolot Haki, Space Time Manipulation and Multidimensional Barrier. As for the last two, there are new sub skills, and one of them is called Limit Break. If I had to guess, it's probably the ability to overcome the user's own limitations or weaknesses during battle. The last one is Dimensional Rupture, which is the ability to penetrate a distortion field and space to destroy the enemy. Besides that, when Kondo offered his soul to Carrera, his ultimate skill, King of Execution, which allows the user to attach specific effects into their attacks, was also integrated into Annihilation King Abaddon. There are four effects. The first one is called Boundary Breaker, which can destroy the defensive barriers of the targets. The second one is Spellbreaker and it can destroy the magic channels within targets preventing them from using magic. Then the Spellbuster which basically destroys the magical circuits of targets and finally Annihilation Bomb, a high density magic bomb that can cause damage by removing magic from the target. Of course now that Carrera has Kondo's gun, she has access to the bullets that he used as well like Annihilation Bullet which incorporates the effect of Annihilation Bomb, Godspeed Bullet, a powerful bullet that incorporates all four effects and it is highly effective against magic users. Then the Exterminating Bullet is a bullet with the Spellbuster and Annihilation Bomb effect effective against spiritual beings. Another one is called Domination Spell Bomb which is similar to Exterminating Bullet but with the added effect of being able to dominate targets. Finally we have the Kamikaze Bullet, the strongest attack that contains all the effects but far more powerful. It can reach speeds that are close to the speed of light, penetrate through all kinds of defensive barriers and can even take down a true dragon, but it can only be used once a day. With a new ultimate skill, Carrera is at the super awakened level with an existence value of 7 million, but when you add the golden gun that gives another 3.37 million, her EV will be more than 10 million so she's definitely crazy powerful. This is why she is considered to have the most magic kills among the primordial demons. Having said that, even though the Eastern Empire was defeated, Rimuru and the others still had to fight Fenton King Feltway and his forces, so they had to prepare a plan for the final battle. But during Walpurgis, none of the demon lords wanted Carrera as their reinforcement except for Milim, who was quite fond of her. No surprise there, but seriously, her reputation really does suck. So Carrera along with Esprit, Geld and Gabiru were sent to Milim's new sky castle in the kingdom of Eurozania to prepare for Feltway's attack. When Feltway and his forces begin their attack on the world, his ally the insect lord Zelenus and his forces were sent to attack Milim's territory. The insecta forces numbered more than 3 million but when Carrera was allowed to fire the first shot, she fired her most powerful magical strike called the Abyss Annihilation wiping out over 2 million insectas. However, one of the insect generals Palliot was able to redirect the magical strike back at them by channeling it into the other world. Luckily, Gael and Millions Barrier Magic was able to withstand the impact long enough for Carrera to dispel it. She proceeded to charge towards the enemies and she went straight for Zest, the leader of the Insect Generous and just for a frame of reference, he was said to be as powerful as the Phantom Commander Zelario so I'll definitely be looking forward to their fight in the upcoming volume. Who knows, maybe Kondo will magically appear to save her. So yeah, that's basically everything on the Yellow Primordial Carrera and I think her fight with Kondo was definitely the most interesting among the Demon's trio because it showed that she doesn't just rely on her magic like most demons but she can also adapt to use a sword when she needs to. But despite her bad reputation, I think she's just a badass that enjoys explosions and I can't wait to see what she does in future volumes. <laughs> Like Testarossa, Ultima is part of the seven primordial demons and she was known as the Purple Primordial Violet before joining Rimuru Tempus. In ancient times, the Purple Primordial was responsible for guarding the underworld gate located in between the domain of the Demon Lord Dagril and Luminous Valentine, but during an unknown battle, the gate was destroyed. 
He would often fight with the forces of Dagru, but when she isn't messing with the Demon Lord, she would spend her time fighting the Yellow and White Primordials. The three Primordial Demons spent so much time fighting each other that the remaining Primordials referred to them as the Demoners Trio. Now, as we all know, Diablo eventually went into the Demon Realm to recruit new workers where he recruited them. At first, she only agreed to meet Rimuru because she was curious what kind of person he was, but after he accidentally dismissed them as threats, the Purple Primordial became quite intrigued with him. Rimuru even thought that the Purple Primordial was just a cute little girl, but don't let her appearance fool you because she's the most cunning, cruel and sadistic of the Primordial demons. That said, the Purple Primordial saw her allegiance to Rimuru and brought with her 200 demon soldiers and two demon lieutenants which were later added to a new legion led by Diablo called the Black Numbers. After the introductions, they moved to the labyrinth where Rimuru provided bodies for the demon subordinates of the Purple Primordial. The Purple Primordial herself was given a special type of Orichalcum body that was created by mixing gold and magisteel. The body is much stronger than normal magisteel and the gold allows for better manipulation of magic cubes. She proceeded to possess the body and easily adjusted to a new physical body which allowed her to finally evolve from an Ash Demon into a Demon Peer. But besides that, Rimuru also gave the Purple Primordial a new name, naming her after the Ultima GTR supercar and increasing her threat level to that of a disaster class. Rimuru even gave both her lieutenants names, one was named after the Bugatti Veyron and the other was named after the Pagani Zonda. Veyron was a demon at the Duke class having lived for more than 4000 years and his strength is only second to the Archduke Moss, the subordinate of the White Primordial with a threat level of a lower disaster class. Then Zonda was a Viscount class demon having lived for around 400 years and he has a Calamity class threat level. Because of Ultima's cunning and attentive nature, she was given the job of Chief Prosecutor of the Public Prosecution Office where she worked with Rogert, one of the Goblin Elders. Her the job was essentially to do detective work and catch anyone committing evil in tempers and sometimes she would also be responsible for intelligence gathering or interrogation work. Now because Tessarosa was rarely in tempers and often worked in Ingratia, Ultima would normally get into arguments with Carrera instead and it became such a normal daily occurrence that citizens of tempers started making bets. They both argued over things like extradition of criminals or the treatment of suspects and sometimes mundane things like food menu items or who gets to buy the latest outfits. That's basically what Ultima normally spends her time doing in Tempest. If she isn't arguing with Carrera or annoying Diablo, she will be working as the chief prosecutor or occasionally challenging the Insecta Zagion who she still has never defeated. Now, when the Eastern Empire attacked Tempest, she was placed in charge of watching over Gabriel's third legion which comprised of the Blue Numbers and the Hyrule. During the battle, Gabriel and his forces were engaging the enemy airships and because Ultima was an advisor to the legion, Gabriel asked her for permission to experiment with the Dragonus Dragon Warriorization ability so they can use it to break through the airship's defenses. Ultima was hesitant to approve it but after realizing that if Gabriel and his Hyrule were successful in defeating the airships without her help and if they managed to get stronger, Rimuru might praise her so she allowed it. But eventually, they were overwhelmed by the enemy airships and Gabiru himself even got trapped by the mana disruptors. Luckily, Rimuru gave the order for Ultima to join the battle so she headed straight for the leading airship. Inside the airship, the Major General Faraga, the leader of the air combat flying corps, was celebrating his victory because he thought that Gabiru was the resurrected true dragon Baldora. But when he turned to his side, he saw a beautiful purple head lolly sitting next to him. This was of course the purple primordial Ultima and she somehow managed to get past the mana disruptors, snuck on board the airship and found a seat right beside Faraga. I mean, that's a giga chat move right there. She then introduced herself and asked about the airships, how they work and even inquired about the remaining forces in the Eastern Empire. I mean it's not surprising because like I said her job was not just finding evidence and detective work, she was also an intelligence marshal so of course gathering useful information was part of the mission. Paragon was angered by Ultima's attitude so he ordered the officers to turn the mana disruptors towards the interior of the ship hoping to cut off her magic use. However, what he didn't account for was what kind of demon Ultima was. If she has any type of demon lower than a Duke class, it would have worked, but because she has a primordial demon, she doesn't need magic cubes from the environment, instead she can simply produce her own magic cubes from her body. But Faraga, thinking that the mana disruptors work, took out his gun, a M1911 that came from our world and unloaded all the rounds at Ultima. Despite shooting the gun at point blank, Ultima was still able to catch all the bullets in the palm of her hand like it was nothing. Seeing this, Faraga took out his magical blade and put all his powers into the blade, striking an Ultima but before the blade landed, she already teleported behind him. Ultima became annoyed by his actions and decided it was best to just extract the information she wants forcefully and so the bridge began to be filled with the sounds of balloons popping, filling the interior with blood and headless corpses, leaving Faragat the last one alive. 
In his desperation, Varga ordered the surviving mages on the airship to pour all their magical energy into summoning a flaming giant, a high-ranking spirit that can only be summoned by heroes, but Ultima simply used the elemental magic Frozen Hell to freeze and shatter the flaming giant. Ultima became bored, so she spared Faraga, letting him fall into despair, and before she left, she created an Abyss Core, a very potent elemental magic created from pure mana, allowing it to manifest into a powerful black flame. The massive flame engulfed the entire airship and eventually expanded into nuclear fire, the ultimate destruction magic. The nuclear fire exploded and it spread to the other airships as well, burning and consuming everything. On her way out, she grabbed Gabiru and she did contemplate about leaving him there as a punishment, but she decided against it fearing that Rimuru might get mad if she accidentally killed Gabiru. Although she did receive the chance to reprimand Gabiru afterwards when Rimuru agreed to let her provide some training to the Dragonudes. But anyways, after the initial Eastern Empire attack was stopped, Rimuru held a reward ceremony to awaken those that were eligible into true demon lords and Ultima was one of them although she was not given any souls because there were not enough souls to awaken the demoness trio together. The reason is that Rimuru had wanted to maintain the balance between them so Ultima was only given a new title as a reward, the title of Pain Lord. However, Rimuru did get some souls later when Gi Crimson asked him to awaken the green and blue primordial Mizari and Rain into true demon lords. It was actually Wisdom King Raphael who scammed Gi Crimson out of half a million souls and using the leftover 300,000. The demoness trio was finally given the souls required to awaken. They eventually awakened into true demon lords after their fight against the true dragon Valgren. During their fight, they were struggling against Valgren but thanks to Tesserosa's intelligence and the advice from Valdora, the demoness trio was able to figure out a way to harm her. They did this by creating weapons with skilled based attacks like Hina Nata Sakaguchi smelt slash and with this in mind, Ultima created two toxic blades that were wrapped in her demonic aura and these were actually the same weapons that she developed to fight against Zagion. Despite understanding how to harm Valgren, the difference in power was still too great and they were not able to defeat her. After the battle with Valgren, the Demon's Trio regrouped with the others so they can launch an attack on the flagship of Emperor Rudra. Ultima along with Tesserosa, Carrera, Benimaru, Shion, Sowe, Veyron, Agera, Esprit and Zonda were the team selected to raid the airship. Upon reaching the interior of the flagship, they were met by the remaining single digits of the Imperial Nilgaard and the four horsemen of the Empire. Valgrim proposed a final battle among the subordinates of Rimuru and Rudra which Benimaru agreed to, so everyone was assigned to their respective opponents. Ultima's opponent was the leader of the four horsemen, Damrada, or also known as the Fist Saint because of his skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat and he was considered to be one of the strongest fighters in the Eastern Empire, rivaled only by Lieutenant Kondo and the true dragon Valgrim. He is a human that has reached the level of a saint, the highest evolutionary stage of humans, equal to a true demon lord and he has a threat level of a disaster class. During their battle, Damrada was able to evenly match Ultima in terms of strength but when she became serious and created 6 pairs of purple wings to attack him, the battle was already decided. But this was also mainly thanks to the fact that Ultima had actually obtained an ultimate skill before the fight. The skill is called Poisonous Death King Samuel which gave her the ability to see through the weaknesses of various living things and creating a suitable poison for her targets. This ultimate skill has 8 sub skills which included Thought Acceleration, Universal Perception, Demon Lord Haki, Space Time Manipulation, Multi-Dimensional Barrier, Weakness Identification which allows her to see the weaknesses of targets, Little Poison Creation, an ability that is able to create any type of poison she wants and finally World of Annihilation, a super enhanced version of Rimuru's Merciless. This sub skill allows her to kill all life forms that do not possess an ultimate skill but sadly Rimuru banned her from using it so you can imagine how deadly this ability actually is. But back to the fight, Damrada knew that he was about to lose so he gathered all his energy for a final attack. His attack worked and Ultima collapsed but when it transformed into one of the purple wings she created, it was already too late. Before he even noticed there was a hole punched through his chest and because Ultima's fingertips were coated with a powerful toxin created with her ultimate skill, Damrada fell and was slowly succumbing to the poison. Before he died, he offered his soul and knowledge to Ultima, asking her to protect Masagi Honjo which she agreed to. She then wrapped his remains with her purple wings, taking the whole of Damrada for her own possession and thus, the Feast Saint was no more, now a new demon of the Feast was born. But even though the Eastern Empire was defeated, they still had to fight against Phantom King Feltway's forces and the Mana Smiker that has taken over Emperor Rudra. During Walpurgis, it was decided that Ultima along with Veyron and Zonda would be sent to the Holy Void Damagania, the domain of Dagru and home to Heaven's Tower, a gateway that is connected to the Heavenly Star Palace, the residence of the Star King Dragon Valdonava and the Angels. When Felway and Michael started their attack, a huge tremor was felt throughout Damagania and when Heaven's Tower opened, Dino, Leon, Gracia, Pico and Fen, the youngest brother of Dagru, came out. 
During this encounter, Ultima had to fight Gracia and Pico, who were both primordial angels, but she was confident of beating them because the both of them only had an EV of 2 million compared to Ultima's own EV of 2 million and 6700,000. However, Dagru suddenly changed size and had betrayed them, so Ultima and Veyron were left alone to fight Leon, Dino, Pico, and Gracia, but luckily Remu arrived with reinforcements. Michael arrived as well and they were ordered to retreat, but eventually Remu defeated Michael. When the battle ended, Ultima, Veyron, and Zonda were sent to Luberius to help Shion fight the giants, so I'm definitely looking forward to that in the upcoming volume. Anyways, that's everything on the Purple Primordial Ultima so far and I don't know why but she kind of reminds me of Tanya Degracha from Yojo Senki because she's also a cruel and sadistic lolly like her. Although Ultima is not really my favourite Primordial out of the Demoness trio, I did found scenes with her to be quite interesting and I look forward to seeing her in future volumes. But yeah, a demon lolly girl, what's not to like? Before we talk about the current Tessarossa and the light novel, let's go over a bit of a past, starting with an infamous event that was related to her, the Lakeshore Dyed Red incident. It starts in a small nation located in the Eastern Empire known as Siberia. Because since ancient times, the land used to be the domain of the White Primordial Blanc, and the first queen of Siberia had made a pact with the demon, the conditions of the pact are as follow. Until a vessel suitable for the Primordial Demon to possess is born, the demon will always protect the land and its people. So that's why the Siberian royal family possessed crimson eyes, pale white skin, and shining white hair, because these were all the blessings from the demon. So with that in mind, this incident started with Princess Blanche Nam Silberia, the next in line for the throne. She was approached by the White Primordial after her mother died and the demon offered to fulfill her wish in exchange for a favour. This favour was of course the pact made between the demon and Silberia. The princess had wished to become friends with the demon which surprised her but the demon accepted so she latched onto the body of the princess. Thanks to the White Primordial, the princess was able to find happiness again but when she turned 16, everything fell apart and in her own despair against the wishes of the demon, she invoked the pact and offered her soul and body to the demon. The White Primordial was deeply saddened and angered because she truly considered the princess as a true friend so she decided to kill those that hurt the princess and consume their souls, leaving a wave of blood flowing into the lake, dying the lake scarlet. The Eastern Empire eventually sent a covert team of Imperial Neergas to stop the Primordial Demon but because the demon did not want to harm the body of a friend and having taken revenge, she no longer had a reason to stay in the physical world. So the demon pretended to lose to the Neergas and returned to the demon realm forever cutting her ties to the human world but before she left, the demon casted a special seal to preserve the body of a friend and laid her to rest underneath the land she once called home, thus ending the Lakeshore Dyed Red incident and now that we talked about the incident, let's go over the current White Primordial. Testarossa, or also known as the White Primordial Blanc, is part of the seven Primordial Demons considered to be the oldest and most powerful demons in the demon realm. Before she joined Rimuel Tempus, she was the guardian of the Underworld Gate located in the Eastern Empire but whenever she is not guarding the gate, she will be fighting the Yellow and Purple Primordial Demons. Because the three of them constantly fought with each other, the other Primordial Demons often referred to the three of them as the Demoness Trio. Later, she along with the Yellow and Purple Primordial were recruited by Diablo who was looking for subordinates to help out with his work. But before she accepted Diablo's offer, the White Primordial actually wanted to kill him and according to Diablo, she apparently does have the ability to harm him if she was serious which is saying a lot about how powerful she already was. But anyways, the Demoness Trio only agreed to meet Rimuru because they were curious about the creature that managed to capture the heart of Diablo. When they met Rimuru, they were impressed by how easily he saw past them hiding their auras but only because Wisdom King Raphael had helped him. Honestly, Rimuru's ignorance is truly a blessing. She offered her loyalty to Rimuru and brought with her 200 demon soldiers and two high-ranking lieutenants. They were added into the Black Numbers, a newly formed elite unit that is under the leadership of Diablo and they directly serve Rimuru. Rimuru then prepared majestic bodies for the demons to inhabit because demons are spiritual life forms with no corporal body so their magic cues would dissipate if they remain in the world for a long period of time. As for the White Primordial, she was given a special body made from Orichalcum, a material that is obtained by mixing gold with Magisteel. Orichalcum has higher quality and greater strength than normal Magisteel and the gold actually makes the skeleton easier to control because gold is very compatible with magic cues. She possessed the Orichalcum body and she was able to quickly acclimate to a new body. So now that she obtained a physical body, the White Primordial was able to break through the ceiling of power that limited demons and evolve from an Ash Demon into a Demon Peer, giving her a disaster class threat level. She and her two lieutenants were also given new names by Rumuru and just like Diablo, they were named after supercars. The White Primordial would receive the name Tessarossa named after the Ferrari Tessarossa while her two lieutenants received the name Moss and Xi'an named after the Mercedes SLR Sterling Moss and Cadillac Xi'an. Like I mentioned just now, Tessarossa was recruited to handle Diablo's chores and because she was familiar with politics, she was given the job of being the military attaché of the Tempest Federation. 
Her job required her to act as a representative of Tempest on the Western States Council and speak on Rimuru's behalf, be familiar with the laws of Tempest and informing the other nations about them. Not only that, if Tempest were to deploy military forces to foreign nations, she would also be responsible for commanding those armies. As for notable events that showcase her talents and skills, the first one was during Grand Bell Russo's attack on the capital in Gracia. Grand Bell had wanted to plunge the Western nations into chaos, so he ordered Johann Rostia, the Duke of the Kingdom of Rostia, to take the Western States Council hostage and eliminate key figures of the council. But what Grand Bell didn't account was that the Tempest Federation representative was the primordial demon Tessarosa, so there was no way Johann could have succeeded. Not knowing the true identity of Tessarosa, Johann continued with his plan and ordered the mercenary group Apostles of Bird to begin the summoning. They were planning to summon their god who was actually the green primordial Mizari. When Mizari arrived, she realized the woman standing in front of her was the white primordial and she was surprised at first but soon understood the situation. Now, although Mizari was considered strong and had already possessed a body in the physical world far longer than Tessarosa, she still couldn't really fight her in a battle due to the difference in combat experiences. So after exchanging a few words with Tessarosa, she simply left. Obviously, this surprised everyone and basically Tessarosa didn't even need to lift a finger to stop Johan's plan and she was even able to gain full control and earn the trust of the council. The only downside is that now that Granba Russo and the Insecta Razu were defeated, Tessarosa had to take on more responsibilities by having her forces defend the northern part of the western nations against the demons of Gi Crimson. But besides that, when the Eastern Empire attacked Tempest, Tessarosa was ordered to monitor the first legion that was led by Gopta. But before the battle started, she went to negotiate with the Eastern Empire forces but it was more threatening than negotiating because Tessarosa just drew a line and asked them to not cross it. Guys, the lieutenant general leading the army was triggered by her and ordered the snipers to fire at Tessarosa. The bullets were travelling at three times the speed of sound and imbued with magic but she simply blocked it with her index finger like it was nothing. But there's more. When she was given the order to join the fight, she headed straight for the enemy stronghold and killed most of the soldiers present by taking away their souls, leaving only guys to play with. Guys was lucky because three imperial near guys arrived just in time to help and they just so happened to be the same individuals that sealed Tessarosa away during the Lakeshore Died Red incident. These three individuals were the rank 11 teams, Bowder rank 38, and Gordon rank 64. They were all at the level of a sage, putting them at least at a disaster class threat level. And because they thought they defeated Tessarosa all those years ago, they could do it again. But that is just wishful thinking. Tessarosa easily broke through their spells and they fell into despair when they realized how strong she has become. Eventually, she decided not to play with food anymore, so she simply used Death Streak to clean out the remaining enemies on the battlefield. Now, Death Streak is a type of nuclear magic considered to be an evil form of magic that releases a magical death ray that can destroy the target's physical bodies on a genetic level, even allowing the user to destroy the spiritual body or soul of enemies in a radius of 10 kilometers. Now, I would like to mention that the souls used during the reward ceremony to awaken the 12 patrons into true demon lords were actually collected by Tessarosa and the other two demoners. However, Tessarosa was not given any souls because Rimuru lacked the souls to awaken the other two girls, and he wanted to make sure the balance of the trio was always equal, so she was only given the title of Killer Lord as a reward. Later, when Guy Crimson asked Rimuru to awaken Mizari and Rain into true demon lords as well, Raphael scammed him by asking for half a million souls. The leftover 300,000 was then used on the demoners trio and they would awaken into true demon lords during the second wave of the Eastern Empire attack. During the second attack, Tessarosa, Ultima and Carrera had to fight against the true dragon Valgren, but because of the difference in power, the demoners trio was having a hard time. Despite that, Tessarosa was the one that managed to discover the secret behind Valgren's abilities and they managed to deal some damage onto the true dragon, showing how intense intelligent she was. However, Valgrin decided to leave, so the battle ended in a draw. When Rimuru's top executives raided the flagship of Emperor Rudra, Tessarosa actually got a chance to face Valgrin again. During the rematch, Tessarosa was able to use her experience from the previous fight against Valgrin, landing several hits on her and even holding out far longer than before. Despite putting up a better fight this time around, Valgrin was still more powerful than Tessarosa, but because she only needed to stall out time, in the end it was a tactical victory for Tessarosa. Honestly, it's still commendable that she was able to fight the true dragon by herself and it wasn't a total loss for Tessarosa because after the battle, she managed to acquire a new ultimate skill known as Death King Belial. This ultimate skill basically gives Tessarosa the ability to literally govern the aspects of life and death, although she mostly uses the death aspect more. Now this ultimate skill has a total of 8 sub-skills, starting with Thought Acceleration, then we have Universal Perception, Demon Lord Haki, Space Time Manipulation, Multi-Dimensional Barrier, Aura Creation, Life Domination which is an ability that allows her to control when, where and how the target will die. And the last sub-skill is called World After Death, an ability that basically plunges an enemy into a hellish world filled with death. 
Now, as for what happened after the Eastern Empire was defeated, Rimuru wanted Masogi Honjo to become the new emperor and help establish a relationship with the Western nations, so obviously Tessarosa was the best candidate to help Masogi as she was familiar with the politics of the Eastern Empire. Within just a short period of time, she managed to consolidate power for Masogi and he became the new emperor of the empire. Now, during the conference between the new Eastern Empire and the Western nations, Phantom King Feltwe and the Manas Michael finally made their move on the world. Feltwe would lead his forces to attack the capital of Ingratia in hope of killing Masaoki, but they were intercepted by Tessarosa, Moss, Hinata, Sakaguchi, and Valgren. During this encounter, Tessarosa had to fight against the resurrected Vega. He was previously part of Cerberus and he was used as an experiment to create vessels for the Phantoms to take over. But because of his immense pride, he consumed the Phantom inside of him and he became more powerful than before, having an EV of over 10 million as compared to the EV of Tessarosa, which is only at 3,333,124. Now, initially, Tessarosa was able to easily fight off Vega, but after he consumed his allies, his power grew to become even greater. Despite the boost in power, Tessarosa was still able to finish off Vega with the help of a newly awakened Hinata by using White Flare, a new ultimate magic that surpassed even nuclear magic which she created with her ultimate skill Death King Belial. Vega was targeted by the spell and after getting hit, his body was consumed by the White Flames, burning everything to ash. However, Tessarosa sensed that before he died, Vega managed to secretly escape with his soul but honestly, Vega was just lucky. So yeah, that's about everything on the white promoter Tessarosa so far, and although the majority of her battles end up being losses or draws, I feel like she's dangerous because of how efficient she is at politics and mainly her intelligence. I mean she was able to help the Tempest Federation earn the trust of the Western nations and even establish themselves in the Western States Council, so I think she's definitely powerful in her own right. All in all, I hope we'll get to see more of this cruel white hair beauty in future volumes, and I would definitely let her dominate me whenever she wants. Before Diablo was summoned by Rimuru, he was known as Nuwa, one of the seven primordial demons, the oldest of the demon race and considered to be the pinnacle of power when it comes to demons. During his time in the spiritual world, he was actually the strongest of the primordial demons and could only be rivaled by Gi Crimson, who at that time was known as the primordial Rouge. However, because Noir didn't value strength and power that much, he remained as an Ash Demon while Rouge had entered the material world and obtained the name of Gi Crimson, becoming stronger than Noir. This was why Gi and the other primordial demons often label Noir and the other demons that are part of his color as weird or oddballs because they often value things that are considered to be against what a normal demon would prefer such as the pursuit of power or causing destruction. But Noir knew he had the ability to evolve into a demon peer like Gi if he wanted to but because getting stronger would make every fight too easy, he decided to stay the same. However, his carefree attitude changed when he became interested in a little blue blob named Rimuru Tempest. Because during a chance encounter with Shizu Izawa in the Kingdom of Fleetwood, he found out about her anti-magic mask possessing the ability to transcend time and infinity. This made him retreat to the spiritual world and he would continue to observe Shizu and the mask until it fell into the hands of Rimuru Tempest. After seeing how the mask reacted to him, Noir concluded that he was linked to the origin of the mask and if Noir worked for him, he would finally uncover the truth to the world. So Noir waited for the chance to be summoned but when Rimuru had performed a greater demon summoning for Remorous, he got cut by Baratta and to add salt to the wound, Baratta was even one of his own descendants. However, Nua didn't need to wait too long because when the Harvest Festival was about to begin, Rimuru had performed another Greater Demon Summoning and this time Nua finally answered along with two of his followers. He was immediately given the task to find Razen who was hiding at the time and after he found him, he was able to easily counter everything Razen used but in the end, he won simply because Razen realized who Diablo truly was and he had passed out. Having said that, after Rimuru had awakened as a true demon lord, Noah joined the Tempest Federation as the second secretary of Rimuru and he was given the name of Diablo, named after the Lamborghini Diablo. After being named, he finally evolved from an Ash Demon into a Demon Peer, considered to be the second highest evolutionary stage of the demon race, making him now a disaster class level threat that is almost at the catastrophe class. He had also acquired two unique skills in the form of the Great Wise Man and Tempter. The skill Great Wise Man served to improve his analytical capabilities, kind of like how Great Sage functioned for Rimuru, but minus the voice talking part. But unlike the Great Sage, this skill only had four sub skills, and the first one is Thought Acceleration. It basically helps to boost Diablo's thought processing speed, and the second sub skill is called Chan Annulment, and this allows him to cast spells without needing incantations. Next is the sub skill of All Creation, and using this skill, he is able to comprehend 
hand almost anything. As long as what Diablo is looking at is visible or perceivable, he can know almost everything about it. This is a pretty nice ability for Diablo because when Rumuru explains some of the concepts from his past life to Diablo, this allows him to quickly understand and interpret those concepts easily. And finally, we have law manipulation which basically allows Diablo to manipulate the scientific and magical laws of the world. Of course, he still needed to have a certain degree of understanding of certain scientific or magical laws to be able to bring out its full potential, which is why it was always used in conjunction with all creation. And to give an idea of how powerful this ability is when paired with Diablo, before he even acquired this ability, it was stated that his computational ability was nearly on Wisdom King Raphael's level, so you can imagine with the Great Wiseman, it could now very well be on the same level. So moving on is the other unique skill Diablo acquired which is called Tempter and it allows the user to mentally restrict targets, completely limiting free will and able to make anyone under its effect into his servants. It consists of three sub-skills, the first of which is called Thought Domination and it basically does what it sounds like. It allows Diablo to manipulate someone's mind according to his will but it can only be done to those who submit to him. But he can easily overcome this by implementing another sub-skill called Charm which allows him to mesmerize the target to make them easier to influence. Then we have the sub-skill solicitation and it causes those that are under the effects of Tempter to have their souls taken by Diablo and through the souls he can either control or monitor the intentions of the target. If a target betrays him or they die, Diablo can easily sense it and quickly dispose of them by destroying their souls, basically like how Clayman had control over Muran. Now you think that's all to Tempter but because Diablo is such an ancient and powerful being, he was somehow able to turn Tempter, a unique skill that only affected targets mentally into a skill with the power to exchange reality and illusions. This resulted in him creating some additional hidden abilities and the first one is called World of Temptation. What this ability does is that it allows him to create an imaginary world where he holds the absolute authority. He's also able to dictate the life and death of any target sent to that world so think of it as something similar to the Mangekyo Sharingan. And then with the help of another ability called Reality Exchange, he can even swap out the things happening in his imaginary world with the real one. And the phantoms and monsters crafted by him inside that world can also take on a real form. Diablo actually used this ability on three of the seven celestial sages who were all considered to be s rank or at the very least a middle disaster class threat level, trapping them inside the imaginary world he created and using the final hidden ability called end of the world, an effect that denies everything that Diablo deems not worthy and it is an ability that brings absolute destruction. This would cause the imaginary world to collapse onto itself, consuming the target's consciousness and destroying their physical form in the real world as well. Now moving over to his extra skills, he has four in total and the first one is universal perception and it just allows him to perceive the surrounding magical energy or magic use. Then he also possesses the skill Spatial Travel and it's a skill used for instant travel to locations the user has been to before. And he also has Multi-Layer Barrier, a thin invisible coating covering the user's body with several layers of defenses. And the final extra skill Diablo has is actually quite special because as far as I know, he is the only non-awakened true demon lord that has the ability of demon lord Haki. This extra skill actually works well with Tempter because it is an aura that the user releases to bend lesser beings to their will. And additionally, it can sometimes deal little damage to targets. But besides his overwhelming power, Diablo is also quite the master negotiator and talent seeker. I mean he even managed to persuade three of the primordial demons to join the Tempest Federation and was responsible for creating one of the strongest military units in Tempest, that being the Black Numbers. And it's certainly not an easy feat because the primordial demons that he recruited, Tessarosa the White Primordial, Carrera the Yellow Primordial, and Ultima the Purple Primordial were three of the most egocentric and ill-tempered among the other primordial demons. Although his intentions were simply to find competent people to give his jobs to so he can just focus on Rimuru, I would say that he still has quite a good eye for finding talented individuals. He was even able to bring over people like Razen, known as the strongest mage in the western nation, and Ghidorah, the powerful court magician of the Eastern Empire. Granted, he did somewhat influence them with his unique skill tempter, but it's still something noteworthy. I should also mention that during the end of the Eastern Empire's attack on the Tempest Labyrinth, Diablo joined the battle and when I say battle, it was more like a slaughter because all Diablo did was snap his finger and he managed to kill Bonnie and Jill. Two single digit royal knights of the Eastern Empire considered to be the strongest warriors in the empire. Then he proceeded to kill Krishna, number 17 of the royal knights and finally he simply took out Kalgurio, the leader of the armor corps who during this had awakened as a saint without even trying. 
After the battle, Rimuru wanted to present gifts to those who were able to awaken as true demon lords and obviously Diablo met the requirements to awaken, so he was given a hundred thousand souls and the title of Devil Lord. And interestingly enough, Devil Lord is also the name for the highest evolutionary stage of the demon species. And because he was able to perfectly control and distribute the energy from the evolution, he didn't need to perform the sleep process like Rimuru did during the Harvest Festival and simply evolve on the spot. And according to Rimuru, after awakening as a true demon lord, the current Diablo likely possesses mana that is comparable to himself, and because of Diablo's experiences and skills, he thought he might even lose against Diablo in a real battle. Reaching this level of power also meant that Diablo became a super awakened because he has an existence value of 6,666,666, an obvious easter egg for the number of the beasts. Anyways, Diablo also acquired a new ultimate skill which combined both of his unique skills, the Great Wiseman and Tempter, along with some of his extra skills to form Temptation King Azazel. This ultimate skill had several sub-skills like Thought Acceleration, which now gives him even greater thought processing speeds than before. Universal Perception was still the same while Demon Lord Haki had been incorporated into the ultimate skill. Spatial Travel was also incorporated and it had evolved into Space-Time Manipulation, which now allows the user to warp space and time. Multi-layer Barrier was also absorbed into Temptation King Azazel while all creation remained the same but as for Charm and Solicitation, both sub-skills became stronger and now have greater effect on targets. And finally, the hidden ability World of Temptation also became a sub-skill and other hidden abilities like Reality Exchange and End of the World were likely added into it. Rimuru also stated that with Temptation King Azazel, Diablo can now do almost the same things as he can which just shows how powerful Diablo truly is. So yeah, that's everything you need to know about Diablo so far, and it's a shame that Diablo rarely has any chance to go all out. Although in volume 18 of the light novel, he was about to face off against Zalario, but we still have to wait for volume 19 to see the conclusion of that fight. That said, Diablo is certainly powerful not only in terms of power, but rather he is one of the very few characters that is capable of always annoying and teasing Guy Crimson. But in all seriousness, who do you think is the strongest in the 12 patrons and personally speaking, I think Diablo has a slight edge over Zijian in terms of overall experience and his efficiency with skills. <laughs> Now before we talk about the current Guy Crimson, I wanted to first go over his origin and how he became known as the first true Dim Lord and earned the title of the Lord of Darkness. To start, we have to go back to before the world was even created when it was empty and only the Star King Dragon Valdenava existed. Valdenava had created the seven primordial angels from the Great Spirit of Light, but from a shadow the Great Spirit of Darkness, it would spawn the seven primordial demons and Guy was the first of them to be born. And since his birth, his power was absolute and he was called the king who ruled over the underworld, but before he acquired that title, he used to constantly battle with Noah, the Black Primordial for supremacy. However, their battle always ended up in a draw, but eventually Guy took the throne because Noah simply became bored of fighting and did not care about getting stronger. That's why Guy had always disliked Noah for his carefree attitude, but at the same time, he still respected him as someone who could fight him on an equal level, so they were something like friendly rivals. Having said that, he was also challenged by the blue and green primordial demons but he completely crushed them to the ground without a second thought and because they were defeated with their cause destroyed, they would submit to Gi and become his loyal servants after their revival. However, his time in the underworld ended when he was suddenly summoned to the material world by the great magician Jahil to end the 100 year war of the super magic empire. Now, although crossing from the spiritual world to the material world had greatly reduced his powers, it was still enough for Gi to fulfill the request. This is because he possessed the forbidden nuclear magic known as Death Streak, a destructive large-scale magic that destroys the souls of his targets, and using this magical attack, he easily destroyed the nations that opposed the super magic empire and killed millions. As a result, he managed to acquire a large amount of souls which allowed him to incarnate into the material world using a million corpses. He would also awaken into the first true demon lord, lifting all his racial restrictions and evolving into a demon peer, but he still only regained less than 10% of his original powers. However, it was enough for him to break free from the summoning spell that bound him, and he decided to gather more souls to test if he could evolve again. And it was only poetic that he attacked the people that summoned him, so he wiped out one of the cities of the super magic empire. It was during this rampage that he would hear the screams of the dying people Gia and realize that he could use this as his name. 
This was basically how Gi would acquire his name and because of this, he was able to evolve from a demon peer into a devil lord, the highest evolutionary stage of the demon race. Now he has finally regained all the powers he once possessed when he was in the underworld, becoming a truly powerful being. And after his evolution, Gi decided to summon both the primordial demons that followed him and ordered them to wipe out the super magic empire. It was on that day that the largest and most powerful nation in the history of mankind disappeared from the face of the earth. However, he wasn't impressed by their strength because like him, both the primordial demons had lost most of their powers but Gi was in a good mood so he gave them bodies to inhabit. But after giving them bodies and even providing them with souls, they never evolved. So he decided to give them names as well. The blue primordial was named Rain because it was raining that day and the green primordial was named Misery to represent the mournful cries of the grieving humans. The naming process worked and both the girls would regain their powers, even evolving into demon peers in the process. Now, with the both of them by his side, Gi would travel from place to place, enjoying all the things that this new world has to offer. The two even learned many skills to become perfect mates and summon their own dependents to build up a sphere of influence all in order to provide Gi with all the wealth and pleasures of the world. Eventually, Gi would meet the creator of the world, the Star King Dragon Valdanava, and he decided to challenge him. However, he was utterly defeated and following the law of the demon race, his defeat meant submission, but his pride wouldn't allow it, so he asked Valdanava to simply give him death. But Valdanava was impressed by his attitude and strength, so he has offered the job instead to serve as the mediator of the world and prevent it from falling apart. Gi accepted the request and they recognized each other as friends on equal terms. Now, the only reason Gi accepted was because he loved this world and enjoyed the company of humans as well, finding their individual differences to be interesting. But he understood that humans are fallible creatures that will be seduced by the lust for dominance and power, so they needed to be monitored to a certain degree. That's why he was convinced of his role as a mediator. And what was his job scope as the mediator? Basically, he just needed to stop humanity from becoming too prideful or do anything that would harm the world that Valdanava created. And if someone was dumb enough to cause problems, he would simply wipe them out like what he did to the Storm Dragon Valdora. And humanity eventually started to fear him as a demon lord and this forced mankind to cultivate a spirit of unity instead of fighting amongst each other. Gi began to live out his days as a demon lord and it was around this time that the demon lord system was also established with the help of misery. Also, I forgot to mention that after his fight with Valdanava, his pride as the strongest was completely shattered but because of this, his mind has grown deeper and his heart materialized, causing him to awaken a new power, the unique skill pride, a skill born from his own willpower and his desire to be strong like Valdanava himself. But in any case, after some time had passed, Gi was commissioned by Valdanava to help the primordial angels in the subjugation of Ivarash, the world-destroying dragon. Gi was really enjoying his time fighting Ivarash because of how powerful it was and they actually fought for 3 months but it managed to escape to the other world. And in the aftermath of their battle, the northern continent had become a wasteland and he recognized the ruins of the imperial castle that once belonged to the super magic empire. So Gi decided to make this area his domain and Rain was quickly dispatched to turn the surroundings into a livable environment and repair the castle. And later he would be challenged by the white eyes dragon Valzad, the sister of Valdanava because she wanted to earn the respect of her brother and she was jealous that Gi had been recognized by Valdanava. So they would fight for 3 days and 3 nights with their battle always ending up in a draw which was quite surprising considering that Valzad possessed the ultimate skill Patience King Gabriel whereas Gi only possessed a unique skill. I guess it's just a testament to how insanely strong Gi actually is, being able to fight on equal footing with someone like Valzad despite having the disadvantage. Although thanks to his battle with Valzad and his previous experience with Valdanava, he finally realized what he lacked and understood the importance of the ultimate skill. Thus, he was able to force his unique skill Pride to evolve into the ultimate skill Pride King Lucifer, an ultimate skill that's part of the demonic system and it has the power to rival even the angelic system created by Valdanava. So Gi now truly became one of the strongest entities in the world and definitely deserves the class of Catastrophe, a being that stands at the level of the true dragons. Also around this time, he already possessed an existence value of almost 40 million. But continuing on, in the aftermath of Gi's battle with Valzad, they had shifted the entire access to the world and the continent he had chosen as his base had become a frozen wasteland, but he doesn't really care because he isn't affected by the cold. And because Valzad was now staying with Gi, her demonic energy caused the air to become frigid and the temperature of the surrounding area to drop to an extreme level, so this would become a frozen barrier to defend against any would-be attackers. And this was basically how Gi and Valzad would meet, so from that day onwards, the two of them had been moving forward together ever since, and apparently, Valzad had fallen for Gi as well and deep in her heart, she secretly vowed that one day she would win Gi over with her charms. Also, I found it funny how Valza decided to go for a cuter and younger human form to impress Gi, but being the Giga chair that he is, Gi just didn't care. Having said that, a few hundred years would pass with not much change in the world and Gi became bored out of his mind. However, one day a group of three would visit the palace of White Eyes and they intrigued Gi because they managed to defeat the two maids and even break through the frozen barrier of Valzad. 
This group consisted of Rudra Naska, the first hero and student of Valdonava, Valgren, the Scotch dragon and younger sister of Balzat, Lucia Naska, the future wife of Valdonava and the mother of Milim Nava. Rudra had wanted to challenge Guy because he wanted to steal his treasures and Guy was actually impressed by how brazen and greedy he was. So both men started the battle but Rudra soon stopped the battle because he didn't want to defeat a demon lord with such a silly name. So he decided to give Guy a cooler name and he came up with the name of Guy Crimson which actually caused Guy to grow in power again. Also if Rudra didn't give Guy his new name, he might have actually been able to defeat Guy in a battle. However, Guy did not actually care about winning and he intentionally held back, always forcing a draw between them. Because for Guy, he simply enjoyed having someone to compete with him and he truly valued Rudra as a friend. Nevertheless, Guy would continue to have battles with Rudra and it basically became their usual greeting but Rudra still tried very hard to defeat him. This was because to him, his battle with Guy was always a battle of ideals and he actually doesn't want to defeat Guy in battle. Instead, he wanted Guy to accept his ideals and join him in creating a world where everyone can live in peace to give Valdonava a peace of mind. However, Guy did not believe in such wishful thinking because he had experienced the greed of humanity firsthand and even someone like Valdonava gave up on this kind of utopian dream. But Guy knew Rudra was stubborn so he didn't reject the ideals of his friend and decided to see how it ends. Although they eventually did stop their usual fighting when Valdonava married Lucia and lost all his powers, essentially becoming a human. Rudra now had the responsibility of protecting them and serving as the emperor of the Nazca kingdom. However, not satisfied without a winner, Rudra proposed that he and Guy play a different game and like I said, Guy really considered Rudra to be his true friend so he agreed to the game. So what are the rules of their game? Well basically, the loser will have to follow the winner and there are some additional rules like Guy and Rudra were not allowed to have any direct confrontation with one another, only their pawns can make any moves against the opposing side, they are not allowed to harm the world itself and they win after eliminating all the pawns of the opponents. Also, Guy will still carry out his job as the mediator if needed as long as he doesn't interfere personally in their game. But sadly, a string of continuous tragedies would eventually cause Guy to slowly lose his friend. It started with the death of Valdonava and Lucia that was caused by a group of terrorists. Rudra had blamed himself for not being there to protect them and his dreams came crashing down. And he was now left with an idea without a purpose. However, Guy still promised to stay with Rudra and play his game because he knew his friend would break if they stopped now. Then another tragedy struck, this time involving Milim when her pet was killed by humans and it caused her to go on a rampage across the western lands so Guy went to stop her. They fought for 7 days and nights, turning a portion of the once fertile lands of the west into a barren wasteland and Milim only managed to come down because of the fairy queen Ramirez. And this event would again take a toll on Rura's psyche but Guy still agreed to play the game. However, as time went by, the ugliness of humanity continued to show and Guy was already expecting a sad future that awaited his friend but he just couldn't abandon him so they continued their game. Sadly, Guy's prediction eventually turned out to be correct, Rudra's mind became corroded and he lost sight of the purpose of the game. Now all that mattered to him was to defeat Guy with any means necessary. And this was how Guy would lose his best friend but he never gave up on him, continuing to follow the rules of the game until the day would come when he can defeat him. So now that Guy's oldest friend Rudra has lost sight of his original goals and the purpose of their game, Guy tried his best to win and their battle would last for more than 2000 years before a victor would be decided and throughout the years, Guy would build up his own pieces which mostly comprise of the demon lords on the council as well as his own demon subordinates in preparation for the final confrontation with his friend. So let's first take a look at his personal military strength. He has around 200 named greater demon soldiers who are incarnated with flesh and they were mostly made up of demons under rain and misery. They were also equipped with magical equipment and their strength was equivalent or greater than the special A. But besides soldiers, Guy also has 6 great demon generals serving him and all 6 were arch demons with names. They were at the Calamity class threat level and possessed powers to rival even the demon lord seed. We also know their names as well. We have Khan, the second in command of Misery, Mizora, the second in command of Rain, and then we have Ulrik, Alban, George and Squall. Also, when Rain and Misery awaken into true demon lords, the six generals managed to evolve into demon peers and now they possess the strength of a disaster class individual, yet the six of them still pale in comparison to the left and right hands of the absolute ruler Guy Crimson, the blue primordial Rain and the green primordial Misery. They used to be demon peers but after they awaken into true demon lords, they managed to evolve into devil lords allowing them to now reach the level of the super awakened class. But yeah, that's basically the extent of Guy's own military strength and next I want to briefly talk about Guy's relationship with some of the demon lords. So Guy has known Ramirez and Milim the longest because they were the original three demon lords that formed the council and regarding Ramirez, Guy considers her to be one of his oldest friends and truly respects her because without her, he might have been unable to stop Milim or at least stopping her with minimum destruction across the western lands. That's why he's quite protective over Ramirez and will destroy anyone that even thinks of harming or betraying her but he does find her to be annoying sometimes. 
Then for Melim, he trusts and respects her combat abilities, even giving her Tenma, a sword that was given to him by Valdanava as a gift, but he still considers her to be an idiot, and he can never really understand her thought process. But moving on, Gi also knew Dino for quite long because he used to work with the Primordial Angels, and he considers Dino to be a useless freeloader. When Dino was kicked out by Daigru and went to find Gi, he simply sent Dino away with the pretense of spying on Rimuru, but actually, Gi was just lazy to deal with Dino. Then we have Luminous Valentine, and Gi does have a degree of respect towards her because of her influence in the Western nations and of course her powers as a true vampire. However, because of her close proximity to Gi's domain, she often has to deal with the demon soldiers that he sometimes releases for fun to rampage across the Western nations. She's lucky that Gi was never serious about conquering the West and only did this for fun. Anyway, for the newer demon lords, Gi likes Leon Cromwell the most and considers him to be a good friend and he often invites him over to the Palace of White Eyes for various discussions. But Gi doesn't only treat Leon as a friend as he often tries to make sexual advances on him every chance he gets despite being rejected every time. Gi even offered to switch gender just for Leon if he was ever interested. I guess that's why Bowser was always hostile towards Leon, she was just jealous that Gi is more interested in Leon rather than her. Now for the others, Gi was quite interested in the Beast King Karen because he saw his potential for awakening in the future but Claymore on the other hand wasn't so good. Gi considers Claymore to be weak and if Rimuru didn't kill him, Gi might have actually killed Claymore himself because of the numerous problems he has caused for Gi through his schemes and the fact that he has been targeting Leon as well. Although I think no other demon lords has caused more issues for Gi than Rimuru Tempest himself. Because of Rimuru's arrival, the game Gi was playing with Rudra has been completely messed up and the balance of power in the world has collapsed as well. But for all the issues that Rimuru has caused, it was quite useful and Gi had basically left all the work to him. And honestly, Rimuru was one of Gi's strongest pieces, being the one to ultimately defeat Rudra's forces and help Gi win their game, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Now, I only talk about Gi's relationship with the Demolods here, but if you want to know more about them, I did a video going over the Demolod Council, so be sure to check that video out if you're interested. But continuing on, I wanted to go over some of the current events involving Gi, starting with the incident caused by Grandma Rosso. Basically, Grandma has been working with Luminous for over a thousand years protecting the northern border, but he has decided to betray her and this has severely weakened the western nations. So not wanting his side to weaken and stop this petty infighting, he decided to pull a prank on the western nations by ordering his demon soldiers to invade the northern border and sending misery to the western nations to kill all the representatives but his plans were ultimately stopped by Rimuru's forces. Although while this was happening, Gi has managed to lure his oldest rival Diablo the Black Primordial out and they both met at the outskirts of Lubarius. Apparently, Gi wanted to question why Diablo, who has never wanted to evolve to suddenly acknowledge someone like Rimuru as his master and how Rimuru managed to take control of the entire western nations. However, Gi would soon regret asking Diablo these questions because he was about to get a lot more headaches after hearing his answers. Essentially, Gi learned that Diablo was crazy enough to invite the yellow, purple and white primordial demons to work for Rimuru and Rimuru was dumb enough to give them names and incarnate them into physical bodies. This left him dumbfounded and he realized he needed to personally question Rimuru so he left. Later, he would regroup with Misery in Lubarius and it was here he would encounter Yugi Kagurazaka and the moderate clown troop trying to escape and Gi knew about them because they were enemies of Leon so he decided to stop them and see what Yugi would do next. But Gi was actually amused by Yuki's brazen attitude to propose they work together and even wanting to challenge him. So Gi humored Yuki by letting him attack first and although his anti-skill can penetrate all magical defenses, when his kick landed, Gi simply stood there and it barely left a scratch. He did this to show Yuki the vast difference in their strength because Gi had already seen through all his skills and abilities and could have easily destroyed Yuki if he wanted to. But Gi wanted to play with him and completely destroy his confidence first so he could watch Yuki amid defeat in despair. So in desperation against the strongest being in the world, Yuki released all his powers and evolved to the level of a saint but against the overwhelming strength of Gi, it was not enough and he was defeated. But you got to give it to Yuki when it comes to his stubbornness because he still had the boss to make a deal with Gi despite being completely beaten. The deal was for Gi to spare him and his friends. In exchange, Yuki would help destroy the Eastern Empire from within and this proposal amused Gi so he allowed them to leave. So now that the incident with Grandpa ended, Gi visited Tempest as promised to ask Rimuru about his real motives and to scold him for his careless behaviour and how his actions had disturbed the balance of power between the demon lords and humanity. He also wanted Rimuru to take responsibility by resetting the status quo but Diablo offered a counter proposal to Gi, stating that Rimuru will be using the economy and guaranteed safety to keep humanity happy. Gi decided to accept this proposal and the management of the western nations was now entrusted to Rimuru and he also informed Rimuru about the Eastern Empire's upcoming attack. 
But besides that, another reason Guy visited Tempest was to ask about Chloe Albert and the true hero Cronoa. Rimuru tried to lie about the situation with Chloe and Cronoa, but Guy wasn't dumb enough to believe him. Luckily, Leon and Luminous were present as well, so they supported Rimuru's explanation with their own lies and Guy had no choice but to accept. Although in an instant, Guy was now clashing blades with the adult former Chloe because apparently he had activated the effect of Time Stop and Chloe had responded to the skill, so both of them were briefly fighting in the Time Stop world. However, they weren't fighting seriously and were only testing each other. Now, after their exchange, he promised to leave her alone and later he wanted to enjoy some of the food and amenities of Tempest but he was scared away by Diablo's constant rambling about his master. In any case, the war with the Eastern Empire started and after Rimuru won the first battle, Diablo had called Gi over to Tempest again because of his connection to the Empire. He arrived with Valzad, Rain and Misery and he would soon explain his connection to Rudra, the game they're playing and the conditions of the game. Afterwards, he decided to give Rimuru the honour of being the one to defeat his friend and help end their 2000 year long game. Of course, Gi knew Rimuru couldn't refuse and so he was forced to take on a job he didn't even want it. But that wasn't all. Gi then politely asked Rimuru to help awaken Brain and Misery into true demon lords because he wanted to observe the awakening process and steal the technique for himself. So he gave Rimuru the souls needed for the awakening, but too bad for him, Diablo managed to drag him away and I guess even a powerful being like him is weak against the abnormal personality of Diablo. Anyways, Rain and Misery were awakened into true dim lords and little Guy along with his group was treated to a banquet before they returned home. Now Rimuru eventually defeated the Eastern Empire and Guy who was in his domain has sensed the presence of his old friends slowly vanishing, realizing that the game between them finally came to an end and Guy who was a demon that has never been emotionally shaken shed a tear for his old friend as he just prayed silently for Rudra's soul. But although the game was over, the seeds of conflict were still smoldering and it would be the signal for the beginning of the Tema War with the appearance of Phantom King Feltway. This was when Feltway would attack Gi in the Palace of White Eyes, even taking control over Valzad. Now I'm not sure if Gi fought both Valzad and Feltway at the same time, but the fact that they had to retreat is still a good indicator of how powerful Gi actually is. Nevertheless, after the battle, Gi called for Walpurgis and according to Ramirez, Gi has never called for Walpurgis himself because he was too prideful so it was definitely serious if he called for one. When all the demons gathered, Gi explained the current situation and their plans for the upcoming battle with Feltway. Eventually, the demons all decided to defend their own nations but with reinforcements provided by the Tempest Federation. It was also decided that Gi along with his forces will relocate to El Dorado, the domain of Leon Cromwell and Walpurgis soon ended. Now during his stay in El Dorado, Gi was having a hard time dealing with Diablo who was constantly picking fights with Leon, Rain and Gi himself. So when Rimuru arrived, Gi voiced numerous complaints like how Diablo had apparently attacked him with full killing intent during their sparring session and how Diablo was trying to convert his loyal servant Rain over to Rimuruism. However, even with Rimuru around, the problem was still present so Gi had no choice but to endure and just wait for Feltway to attack. Eventually, Feltway did attack Aldrado with his forces and because Valzad was present as well, he was unable to contact Rimuru and since Gi was the only person capable of fighting Valzad, he was forced to engage her in battle. And because she was now in her true battle form, Gi knew that he had to fight seriously and although he only has an existence value of almost 40 million, while Valzad has twice that amount, he's still capable of fighting her evenly because of his superior combat abilities. They started to battle in the sky, creating a deadly space where no one could intervene and Gi was trying his best to contain her so that the surroundings won't be destroyed. And apparently, Yi had noticed that although Valzad was being controlled, she wasn't actually resisting the effect because this aligned with her long repressed desire to be with Yi. So this lover's quarrel is definitely on Yi for ignoring her all this time and realizing this, Yi had no choice but to intercept Valzad and stay with her until she was satisfied. Eventually, Rimuru and the reinforcements arrived, but they had lost Leon and also when Gi asked for help, Rimuru just pretended not to notice him, which was quite funny. Having said that, that way would soon retreat and later, Gi and Rimuru gathered their forces to exchange information about the battle. Gi decided to scold Rimuru for ignoring him and he was punishing his two dumbasses as well because while everyone was fighting desperately, Rain and Misery were busy having fun drinking with the enemies. But on a more serious note, Gi decided to handle the protection of El Dorado now that Leon was gone and after confirming the enemy's strength and readjusting their plans, Rimuru left with his forces to help the others. That's basically everything involved with Gi so far and before I end the video, I wanted to use some of my knowledge about the way skills work and their effects to roughly guess some of the sub skills or effects that his ultimate skill Pride King Lucifer might have because there's actually not much information on the skill itself. Again, this is just me guessing and this isn't official and why not leave your own opinions about his ultimate skill in the comments below, I would love to see them. 
Now let's start off with some of the more common skills that we will see in other ultimate skills like thought acceleration, demon haki, and maybe even future attack prediction. I also think that it might contain all creation and multi-dimensional barrier because we saw him creating a barrier in the anime and he has been known to create weapons as well. And it's also possible that he has some sort of law manipulation and if we base it on his color scheme, I'm guessing he might have control over fire. But besides that, Time Stop is definitely one of the official sub skills. I mean, he actually used the skill against Chloe, so I'm pretty confident about this one. Now, as for the effect of Pride King Lucifer, I'm basing this on information from the web novel, so take this with a grain of salt. And what this essentially does is allow Guy to completely copy any skills or abilities that he has seen once, allowing him to use it himself, which doesn't really make sense because all ultimate skills are unique to their users. So, again, I won't really take this information as true until we get a confirmation from the light novel itself. So anyways, those are the 7 primordial demons found in the Tensera series and hopefully you now have a better understanding of their overall story and strength. But who do you think deserves to be called the strongest and by far who's your favourite? Remember to leave your answers down below. If you made it to this point and you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like. Also remember to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification button for more anime content like this in the future. Thanks for watching and as always, stay safe everyone.